Welcome back to Tumor Board with Hilario and Anish. I'm your co-host, Anish. And this is Hilario. Today, we are going to dive to the very important but under-discussed topic of personal finance. Many medical trainees, including myself at one point, have very little idea about money management and how to allocate their funds. Although we get a very extensive medical education, we are not usually taught the best ways to pay off what could be an enormous debt and still save for important life purchases like house and payments and other things. And really, we're not taught how to grow our wealth and live the life we may hope to do. So to help discuss this topic, we have brought in Dr. Achin Patel, who also goes by AC. AC is a good friend of mine from medical school, and he's currently a hospitalist. He's someone who, despite the time needed to study for medical exams, had dedicated himself to understanding personal finance topics and the stock market. He's become an avid trader and an avid saver, and is now on a mission to better educate others on these topics, and has since even started a YouTube channel to do this, which you can find in the show notes below. So AC, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's a great podcast and a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to talk about some finance today. Awesome. So Hilaria, why are you taking away? All right. So AC, this is my first time meeting you. So uh, before we start talking about personal finance, would you be able to tell us about, you know, how you actually got interested in medicine and then we can go into the finance part of, of this conversation? Yeah, of course. Nice to meet you um, virtually. And, you know, it's, um, I think my interest in medicine was uh, twofold. So I, I entered college just being interested in the sciences and I wasn't really sure of what I wanted to do. And my parents were definitely encouraging me to choose a career trajectory. You know, my mom always wanted to be a doctor. And so she always kind of encouraged me to go into medicine. But they left it open-ended. So, you know, I ended up doing a human physiology major, and I also had an econ, uh, a minor in econ. And so I kind of was still open-minded. And so after I graduated, I ended up taking a job as a medical scribe. And so this was kind of my litmus test. I wanted to see, you know, is this something that I could be interested in? What is the day-to-day -day like? And I ended up working with an orthopedic surgeon, actually. And um, I got to see some surgeries in the OR. I got to do clinic with him three times a week. And so I, I fell in love with it. I mean, it seemed pretty cool. And he he honestly was a really good mentor. And so sometimes you just vibe with a personality. And so he kind of encouraged me to also go into medicine. And I applied. And then the rest was kind of just history. Oh, nice. nice. And then so you, you went to Albert Einstein for medical school. And that's where you met Anish? Yeah, yeah. I went to Einstein. Um, honestly, the best school in the United States, I have to say. It's just, <laughs> the, 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 it's, it's just the community there. I cannot understate it enough. It's just the people you meet there. Yeah, the people you meet there are just fantastic. And it, it's literally everybody. Like, I, there are probably 180 people in our school, in our class. And I, I could honestly say I've talked to each and every one of them. Like, a real conversation, not just passing by in the elevator. So it was really neat. Right. Um, so, but, yeah, I really liked Einstein and the group of friends we had, um, we probably had a yeah. core group of 10 to 15 friends. And, you know, we were all quite unique. Like we all were interested in medicine, different specialties, but we also had interests outside of medicine. So it was really fun. Yeah. All right. That's what made it good. Well, it sounds like you guys had a really good time at Einstein, but, but I'll have to disagree that it's, it's, it's the best. <laughs> uh, temple, temple, temple all the way. Um, so. You know, I think like people's comfort with finances is really based on whether their family of origin, whether they were able to freely talk about money and stuff like that. So what what is your family background on like finances? Is that something like when you're growing up, like, you know, your family talked about, you know, money and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, I think you're right. I think a lot of our personal comfort with finances really comes down to our interactions with our friends and family growing up. And for me, I didn't really have much of that, actually. My parents um, were both software engineers. They both, you know, were high earners, um, and they definitely liked to spend money. And we, I felt like, you know, we, my parents immigrated here when they were young. And so we definitely, you know, um, immigrating and not knowing anyone, it, it takes some time to build up some wealth. And so we definitely grew up middle class, but I never really was worried about money. Um, mm. But I've never really talked about it, and it didn't really start – hitting me until I actually um, had that first job. So that mentor I was talking about, his name was Dr. Happenrapper, actually, he was an orthopedic surgeon. 
And when I met him, he was actually like 60, I don't know, he was in his early 60s and he was an amazing person, but I always just wondered, I was like, how is he still working so hard at the age of 60? And, <laughs> you know, I, I never really pressed him on it, but, you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe it was fortuitous, but one, after I got into medical school, he actually, like, it was my second or my first or second week after, he sat me down and he's like, so what do you know about a Roth IRA? What's a 401k? And I was like, is this a medical term I'm supposed to know? Like, I'll go home and look it up, I promise. And, and he was like, no, no, no. He's like, no, really? Like, you don't, like, do you know what retirement is? Like a, you know, like a retirement account? And I was like, I have no idea. So mm -hmm. we were in clinic. And was, this was at noon. I used to have lunch with him. And he actually sent me home that day. So he was like, these are the five things you need to look up. Come, come, you know, leave for the rest of the day. I don't need you. And we'll talk about it tomorrow. And, and honestly, that was like the spark. And I didn't know much, but I made like a couple grand that first year as a scribe. I saved it away and I put it in a Roth IRA mm -hmm. and then I forgot about it. Um, but I think mm -hmm. that planted the seed. And then, you know, going into Einstein, I think a lot of things changed along the way. But that was my first real exposure. It wasn't through my parents right. or friends. It was really, I got lucky. This mentor of mine just happened to kind of, yeah, this yeah. guy, this guy knew something, you know, he like knew and he just, he wanted to show well, you. That's he, awesome. It's funny yeah. because he, he always, he, he ended up telling me later, this was a, he was, he was unique in so many different facets, but he actually, his family came from uh half and the beer company it was a German beer company. And so he mm. actually was very wealthy independently. Like he didn't need to go into medicine. So he right. chose medicine to make money on his own, but he realized that he's working so hard because he just spent so much money along the way. He probably was making a million dollars a year by spending a million dollars a year. And so he was like, I'm 62 and I'm kind of in the same spot where I started. So he was like, don't, don't be like me. Wow. You're going to learn a lot about medicine, but no <laughs> one is going to teach you how to kind of take care of yourself. And so he kind of, I don't know what he saw in me. I'm glad he like had that conversation, but it definitely uh, was eye opening. Wise words. Yeah, I did. I definitely wish I had that. Uh, and it's, did you have any background like that where you had someone teach you about money? And stuff? No, not, not really. You know, <clears throat> I think, you know, my parents worked very hard, but definitely low middle class. And mm -hmm. I, you know, as I've gotten older and as I've made money, I've come to understand how I think really good my dad is with, um, with the numbers and with the accounting principles. Mm -hmm. But I think, the idea of like growing well, I don't know. We just like, never talked about it. And I think he didn't want my attention on that. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I think some of this is immigrant mentality, like just focus on your school. <laughs> um, he didn't right, really want my right. attention on that. But um, I think some of these ideas of growing well and whatnot were not things taught to me. And only mm -hmm. now I'm having mm -hmm. some of these conversations with my parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I got a sense of like how you guys, you know, started out. Uh, I I didn't really know anything about you know personal finance i just knew that you know before before i got into residency and my dad said oh when, when they pay you save some money <laughs> that, that was yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't really into you know uh you know investing in, in the stock market in fact i had to teach him that once i got you know educated um but did your medical school stick do anything regards to like personal finance for you at all? <laughs> AC, you yeah. want to take this one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure. It's a really good question. And I think uh, the bottom line is, I think <laughs> our school system does a lot to teach us medicine, but they don't really teach us about personal finance. Maybe we had mm -hmm. one or two days where we learned about healthcare spending and budgets and like public health policies mm -hmm. in regards to finances. Right. I actually remember we had an eight hour day where it was a public health day. And I do remember like <laughs> some money talks, <laughs> but it was more about how, what we can do to save the healthcare system money, what we can do to be better for the healthcare system. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. But it, but I don't think there was a single day where they asked us what our goals were for ourselves and what we wanted mm -hmm. to get with our finances. It was probably taboo to talk about. I just remember the last day they had a 15 minute conversation and they were like, this is your exit interview. This is how much debt you have. <laughs> what is your plan to pay it off? And it wasn't even, I don't think it, I don't, I think it was just something they probably had to do to checklist that they did it. And so I think a lot of medical schools do this. They just, I don't know why we don't talk about it. It's not, it's not as if we're going to talk about the money and then run away from medicine like i think all of us are in it mm. for the right reasons for the most part <laughs> i think right. a lot of it you know 
if we just if we just we just think you just need to normalize talking about it and i think that will make mm-hmm. physicians happier because we can talk about it later but i think a lot of burnout comes from financial kind of worries and clothes so um yeah i, I would I, yeah. I would just add i feel like my exposure medical school to these topics are really because of the friend group and nothing to do with the actual uh, yeah. uh, medical school itself um yeah mm-hmm. yeah so i think i remember we had a um one talk by one of our up to like attendants in like medical school he came in and he started talking about roth and just like he asked like what what was he talking about like uh and then he started talking about you know the stock market and all that but the only thing that i you know i took from it and then the only thing that he had on his last slide was that if you don't get anything from this talk remember that compound interest is like the seventh wonder or something of the world and like and he started like he asked this question about uh would you rather someone give you like a uh, million dollars right now today or someone would double a penny every day for a month and then if you do the math it's like somewhere around like over 5 million or something if you, if you double so if you have a penny today you double it tomorrow you double those two pennies and then you double those two pennies again four pennies right and then you keep doubling it by the end of 30 days you have more money than a million dollars and when he, when he said that i was like no way and then like i you actually calculate it and it's like so much more money so that was like oh man so that's why people invest or people do this like you know stock market thing but again that didn't really get me interested in doing it until much much later yeah i think it's i think it's interesting because <clears throat> we often talk about finances like the numbers and i think a lot of us in medicine don't really care about finances or numbers because we went mm-hmm. to medicine for the sciences and to help people and so what i try right. and tell remind people is i i i like numbers i'm a finance guy but that's not the reason why i'm interested in finance nor should you be interested right. in finance i care right. more about what do you want to get out of your personal like career and life and what do you want to do outside of medicine and how can we mm-hmm. have your career work to build the life that you want and so i think if you redirect people to remind them that you're going to be a doctor you're going to you know be in medicine but what do you want outside of medicine i think it motivates people a little bit more to think about their own finances because it's really hard mm-hmm. to be like you know just save money for the sake of saving money that's not the point the point is to right. save money so you can live and work the life you want to live and i think if we right. did a better job of reminding people that they'd be way more interested in it and so right. it, it's not just the numbers like we can talk about the numbers and maybe 10% of people will be infatuated by it but for the majority of doctors <laughs> they just don't care <laughs> it's really like the framing right it's how we frame it that's that can be really game changing um so you see you know you said this experience with the orthopedic surgeon was really got you familiar with the concepts and perhaps even served as a catalyst. But how did you go about, you know, educating yourself on these personal finance topics? And was this something you did throughout medical school? Um, or was there really like a spark within medical school at a certain time that really triggered um, you spending more time to learn about this stuff? Yeah, I, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I, I think it was a slow process through osmosis. And I think the first time I had to start thinking about finances was when we first started taking money or we started borrowing money. I don't know if you remember, mm-hmm. but we had to sign that form for like, how much money do you want to take out in graduate <laughs> loans? Yeah, and yeah. The first, I think I had like undergraduate <laughs> loans and it was like maxed out at like 45, I don't know, some amount it was maxed out at. And then we could get another amount of loans, which was like the direct loans or some sort of extra loan and i was like i really need to think about this cuz i can't just take all of this money out <clears throat> that was the first time i started thinking about it and then luckily you know again fortuitously a lot of our friends were naturally talking about finances and <laughs> i think uh there is there's one person in particular i mean i can shut him up kevin like he yeah this my a good friend of ours uh anish knows him as well he i think he had a finance background and we would you just talk about it every once in a while and he had he was definitely a more advanced uh he was definitely more advanced by the time we met but i think through talking about it and being interested in it i started doing my own research and the first book i read that actually hit home for me was the white coat investor and so it's a very easy read it's probably like 60 70 pages it, it's very it's very basic stuff but for me not knowing anything it was it was quite helpful and then after that i had to like after that, I had more 
direct questions and I was like, okay, so what are, I'm sure you guys have these questions to you. Like, what should I, how much should I save in residency? How much should I budget after as an attending? Um, should I focus on paying down my debt or should I focus on the stock market? And so the White Coat Investor podcast is actually fantastic because I think there's over, mm-hmm. there were over 300 episodes when I started listening yeah, to it. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's more than done now. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and you just, you can just scroll through and pick a topic you're interested in. So I think one of them at the time was PSLF for medical students and residents. So I just listened to a 30 minute mm-hmm. podcast about that. And, you know, that kind of just helped. And so it, it's just kind of osmosis. It, it, it wasn't just one source, but I think talking about it, being interested in it, and then having those discussions with your friends after you've listened to a podcast is very helpful because then you get different perspectives, you know? I remember, I, I think, I don't know if it was third year, I think it was third year or a gap year where I started really getting interested in it. And you and you know, Kevin and you know a couple of other friends used to really you know talk about a lot that I bought the White Coat Investor and then I got really, <laughs> yeah. really into it. Um, yeah, I think when you're surrounded by that environment with people actually interested in, you have these conversations, it really sparks, sparks that learning. Um, did you feel like the white coat investor and, you know, he did a great job with laying, I think a really great foundation for students. Do you think that's everything students or trainees should know at, or should they try to learn more even during this time or kind of wait? Till they come come out um, and become an attending. Yeah, it's a good question. Like, how much how much time and energy should you put into learning about your mm, finances? Exactly. And I, I think for ninety five percent of people, I honestly do think that if you read the White Coat Investor and listen to five or ten podcasts that are interesting to you, you probably have enough knowledge to be successful in your career. I think the amount of knowledge that is packed into the book and then the podcast probably will get you enough to get on the right path. And for those who have more of an interest, they can learn some more intermediate topics and advanced topics. And I think, you know, they'll just self-filter. But I think that you just got to have, you just have to get started and figure out how much do you want to invest in it. And it's going to vary for every person. I, I think for some people, it's going to be like, this is more than enough. I'm happy with the knowledge I have now. And I feel comfortable opening up a Roth IRA, investing in an index fund, paying down my debt. Honestly, that if you did that, that's more than enough to be successful. It really <laughs> mm-hmm. isn't that complicated, but just knowing the terms, knowing what to do, that mm-hmm. really is all it takes. Um, was there a book after The White Coat Investor or was there, or is it more like reading online, maybe blogs, maybe other videos? Or was there kind of a single resource that was yeah. helpful? No, that's a good question too. Um, and the white coat investor is a good beginner pathway. And so for me, I, 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 I've always been interested in finance. And so I didn't really want to stop at the beginner topics. And so for me, I, I don't know if you have heard of this topic, but I've um, kind of found this community called fire. Um, have you heard of that before? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Financial yeah. independence. Yeah. With that early. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, I think it, it gets a bad press sometimes because people are like, oh, you just want to work less. You want to retire early. When in reality, I really only care about the first part of it, the financial independence, because that just allows you to control your own time. So even if I was able to be financially independent, I probably would still continue to practice medicine as a hospitalist, maybe a little bit less, maybe in a different setting, but I probably would still continue to practice. I would just have more control of how I practice. And so for me, once I read The White Cone Investor and I found that there is an avenue to build a life and a career that allows me to figure out how much I want to work, I'm like, okay, I should look into this. Cause I know that is what's going to create longevity and happiness. It's, it's figuring out how much I want to work. Cause in residency, I was, I really was burnt out by being told how much to work and how often to work, especially mm-hmm. with COVID. Like, you know, I don't know if you guys were medicine residents or prelim years. We, during were, COVID. we were interns initially during COVID. Yeah. yeah. I, I think being interns and in the medicine department, I'm sure you guys had to work pretty hard too. Like, you know, mm-hmm. it, it was all hands on deck and everything was just taken for granted. Like everyone just had to work harder and harder and all of your vacations and electives were taken away. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and that's when I realized, you know, um, medicine can be all company all encompassing if you let it. And so that's kind of where I decided I have to at least think about the things that are important to me as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think what you just said kind of ties into uh, 
our next question or like why do you believe it's important that you know trainees like focus on their personal finances right uh and you know you mentioned financial independence do you think there's any other reason for people to really be worried about it say i want to go into medicine to just go cure and treat people right why do i need to worry about you know finances right yeah no i that that the other side of the spectrum right like what if mm -hmm. i don't care and is it going to affect me right and i think the reality is yes unfortunately um only because mm -hmm. the majority of graduates uh, that graduate from medical school have debt i think i didn't look up the most recent numbers but i think it was close to 200,000 the last i checked and so regardless mm -hmm. of whether you like finances or not it's going to affect your life unfortunately um you're going right. to have to learn how to pay off your debt the cost of living is going up. And so, you know, even if you don't care about finances, you're still going to want to live a comfortable life or, you know, <laughs> figure out some of the things that you want in life. And mm. on top of that, at some point, you probably want to dictate your own work schedule. And so, mm. you know, let's say you're, you've worked for 10, 15 years, but you're in the same position you were as a graduate, you know, you still maybe are in a little bit of debt. You still are worried about, paying off a mortgage or your finances, it's going to add stress to your life. And I, I don't, again, I don't really think it's just about the money. I think it's about longevity in your career. Even if you're an altruistic physician and you only want to help people and do these things, I think burnout is going to affect some of us, all of us in some way or the other. I think it's just an inevitable system we're working in. And so just taking a little bit of time to take care of yourself, I think it's important. And it's, um, for me, mental health and financial health can actually be tied together. I don't know if this is like a novel concept, but I do truly believe that. I think <laughs> if you take mm -hmm. care no, of your financial it, yeah. a little bit, your true. mental health mm -hmm. will be better. And I think right. all of us should, you know, want to improve our mental health too, because I think it's hard right. to take care of patients when we are not feeling well ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think like maybe, maybe we can uh, step back and maybe you can help us define what, what we mean by personal finance here because uh you know on one end you talk we're talking about investing on the other hand we're talking about just like making sure that like you, you know how much debt you owe right and and how much money you're saving into just even if it's a savings account in your bank like what what are you exactly talking about when you say personal finance yeah no this is a really good thing to hone down on actually so personal finance is a huge topic and when people talk about personal finance, they usually talk about investing. But investing mm -hmm. is only one pillar of personal finance. So there's actually four or five pillars of personal finance. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think the most, so I'll just name them and then we can talk about which ones are important. But one of them is your income. Another is your savings rate. Another is your spendings rate. The fourth is investing. And the fifth is actually mm -hmm. um, insurance policies. And so whenever right. people talk about finance their, or mm. personal finance, they just go into investing. And right. I don't think that's where we need to start. I actually think your income and your spending is a better place to start because that's mm -hmm. what everyone has control over, whether you're right. a resident, um, a med student, uh, an attending, mm -hmm. everyone has some degree of control over that, your spending and your income. So I think that mm -hmm. that's, you know, an easier thing to control too, because it gives you more right. personal sense of, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it gives you more control over what you're doing. Right. And that, that's, and that's a good point because like, I think when we're in medical school or when you're in residency, there's two things that I hear, right? So if you're a med student, it's like, well, how do I, you know, when someone says personal finance, the first thing they go is how do I invest if I earn no money? Right. Because you, yep. you're already getting student loans, right? And then if you're a resident, you're like, well, I'm only earning a little bit of money. Like, <laughs> why would I invest that money? When do I decide, you know, whether I'm going to invest this money or should I just put it into my student loans that I already have that I'm building up, right? So, like, uh, in your in your ways, like, how do you how do you prioritize what what you're doing at, at any point in time? And from what I guess, if a little bit of what you're saying right now is that like you you know, you need to watch how much you're spending as a, as a background. And then there's more that you can add to it. Is that what, is that what you, you Yeah. And, and I think, I think the number one thing to remember is being a med student and a resident is really hard. It's really <laughs> difficult because you're already <laughs> going through this vigorous training and, and like learning. And so if, if the finances are not the first thing on your mind, that's perfectly okay. And that's probably how it should be. So 
before you know we talk about the finances i think even as a med student and a resident just remember um the finances will take care of themselves but you should do everything in your power mm -hmm. to take care of yourself so in terms of spending you know i'm very lenient with what your budget looks like as a resident because I, I think I even I just graduated six months ago, so I still remember how much I was making. I think <laughs> after taxes, it was fifteen hundred. It was fifteen hundred biweekly, so three thousand dollars per month was your paycheck. I lived in Boston. Mm -hmm. My rent was twenty two hundred dollars. I paid utilities; it was another two hundred dollars. I ate food; <laughs> so that was another two hundred dollars. So I think I was left with like three four hundred dollars per month to like uh -huh. I don't know live life, and. Luckily for us, I didn't have a lot of time to do anything. I was in the hospital all the time, so I didn't have a lot of time to spend the money. But, you know, I, I think that whatever remaining money you have, just pick the things that bring you genuine joy and spend money on that. So if that's going out to a restaurant with your friends once a week or um, going to a sporting event or a concert, whatever it is, do stuff that brings you joy in residency and make sure you spend money on those things. And that will help you get through residency. And then in terms of savings, just, you know, I, I don't even think it's about the amount of money you're saving. It's more about building that muscle, right? So if you are someone who starts thinking about your finances and even puts away $10, $20 per week or per month, you'll just build up this idea that I need to save some money. And then as an attendant, you'll be able to do more. And so just opening up a Roth IRA, opening up a 403B, it will prime your brain to be thinking about that already and then the rest will take care of itself as an attending so i think that's the mindset it changes every at every path you know it's not the same as a med student as a resident as an attending it's very different along each path mm -hmm. so it looks like really the the mindset is is key because i mean the numbers you just said right it, it's like you know 70 percent of your income is just it's it's gone, you know, just with right. like you said, your rent. I mean, some places, some programs might be a little different, but um, in your case, Boston, the higher cost of living than other places, rent is fairly expensive. It looks like um, you're really not mm -hmm. saving much, but I guess like whatever you can um, is important in getting that practice in. Yeah, and I think the the things I would say as a resident, if you are interested in savings, look up if your program <laughs> has a four or three B with a match. Because if a if your residency program has a match, that's literally free money. So if you put away a hundred dollars, mm. your residency program will also give you a hundred dollars. So that is essentially if you were able to put all of your money, like your entire paycheck, you'd be doubling your income, which is huge. So mm. if you can if you do have a match, I would encourage you to max out that match. And that's really mm. the best bank for your buck as a resident. And then the next step yeah. is just to open up a Roth IRA, just so you have an account and you're familiar with all what all that means. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, since, since you started bring, bringing it out, let's say you're in residency and, you know, after looking at all your finances, <laughs> you're able to have something that you can save, right? You know, uh, after your rent or, you know, car or whatever, and you have something to save, like, I guess like, maybe you can walk us through what investing vehicles should you prioritize over the others. Yeah, yeah that's, that's perfect. So there's different vehicles to invest like you said and so the ones that people should be familiar with there's really three big ones in the investing world there's retirement accounts which are things like 403bs and roth iras and then there are um, things like your individual brokerage account which is kind of the next step once you've maxed those out and then other mm -hmm. avenues are like real estate and other kind of other places and so as a resident mm -hmm. i think you just try your best to at least put some into a tax advantage account like a Roth IRA or a 403B, and that should be your goal. Not to max it out, because to max out a Roth IRA, uh, a 403B, it's like $20,000. And I don't think any resident mm. is going to be able to do that. It's just not really possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> unless you're a radiology yeah. resident and you like, then maybe it's possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, right. so yeah, I, I would say number one, Roth IRA, number two, 403B, mm. and then the rest mm. you can kind of forget about until you graduate. For someone who doesn't understand what uh, tax advantage, what do, you, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So normally, if you were to just open up a brokerage account with like Vanguard or Fidelity and you just invested money in a regular account, you're going to pay 20% in taxes when you make profit. So mm -hmm. the benefit of a retirement account is you pay essentially less taxes. And so a Roth mm -hmm. IRA, it lets you pay the taxes up front and then the rest of the money will grow tax-free. 
Luckily for us as residents, our tax bracket is pretty low. So you pay those taxes mm -hmm. up front, and then for the rest of your 30, 40 years, it grows tax-free. Mm -hmm. And so that's the advantage of a Roth IRA. And that's why it's really important to start early. Okay. Just remember, you don't want to just invest in the Roth IRA. I know a lot of people, they said, <laughs> I put $3,000 into the Roth IRA. It's literally still $3,000 six years later. And I was like, did you invest it or did you just open up an account? And so there's something called a money market and like a money market fund, which is essentially just a savings account. So you put money in, right. but it doesn't mean you're invested in the stock markets. So you have to make sure mm -hmm. you actually invest the money once you've opened right. the account. And so a lot, I think a good portion of people forget to do that step. And so they get kind of frustrated when they open it up years later. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I read an article, you know, not someone at medicine, but just, you know, someone who had over time had put in like $130,000 over a number of, you know, number of years into their raw um, and didn't invest anything. So you know, I feel really bad. Really that's bad that's that, gonna be like really bad twenty years. Yeah, yeah it's exactly, awful. exactly. Twenty years, and they retired expecting to have like a million dollars, but or whatever. You know, never looked, and then you know, it, it's yeah. really, it's really sad. It's an to, easy mistake to make, right? You're like, I opened up a Roth IRA, I put money, and you assume it's already in the market. You're like, well, it's in the Roth IRA, it's invested, but people mm -hmm. forget. You know, there's a next step. You can choose how you invest that money. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. let's talk about specific um, budget, type of budget, um, or mobile applications or any platforms that trainees could maybe use to make things easier for them. Is there something that you yourself use when just looking to assess how much money you should put in each, um, you know, each, each bin, if you will? Yeah, no, I think having a budget is really important. And for most people, it would be very helpful. I personally have never used one of these apps. I just had a mental framework, but I do think I'm going to start using an app just because it'll help mm -hmm. kind of take away that guesswork. Um, I know there's a lot out there. There's things like you need a budget. Um, I think um, actually, yeah. There, <laughs> I, started, I restarted my, uh, my account with that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I think the more important thing is, regardless of what avenue you use to kind of bookkeep your finances, um, you'll probably, you've probably heard of something called the 20, 30, 50 rule where it says kind of what portion of your spending should occur in each avenue. These mm -hmm. budgets don't really apply to residents or trainees. Cause it, like I said, we're, our pay structure is kind of in a weird spot. Like we, we're not able to save 20% or, you know, spend 80% here. I think the more important thing to do is just, um, put away as much as you can as a resident and savings. And then when you become an attending, immediately try and save 20%. And you'll, you'll notice that it's quite easy to do as an attending. And by savings, I don't mm. mean just investing in the market. If you're paying off loans, I consider that to be a part of your savings rate. So if you're making a $3,000 payment towards your loans every month, I would consider that savings because you're paying down debt and you're putting money away towards that. So I would say pay yourself first, no matter what budgeting tool you use. And then you can spend the money however you want. And I would aim for at least 20 to 30% as an attending because mm -hmm. you're still used to living like a resident and you'll notice that you're going to have enough money and it's going to feel like a huge lifestyle creep <laughs> with just those extra, <laughs> extra funds. And so don't, don't starve yourself. Like you should definitely indulge in some of the luxuries, but try not to have lifestyle creep so quickly because it's very mm -hmm. easy to just get a mortgage, buy a new car and upgrade all of your luxuries. And as an attending, it's very easy to have lifestyle creep happen very quickly because everyone expects you to spend a certain amount of money and you probably mm -hmm. feel like you owe it to yourself because you worked so hard for 10 years. <laughs> but mm -hmm. Just right. do your best to spend money on things that bring you joy. So if you mm. like meal prep services or you like eating out, spend money there. Don't buy the expensive mortgage, the expensive car, and the expensive yeah. chef all at once. Like, do things slowly. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. don't upgrade right. everything all at once. Mm -hmm. right. That's a really good point because um, I'm actually on the Facebook group for White Code Investors. The moderator of the Facebook group says is that one of the things that, like, they find is that physicians are like kind of like holding themselves from like spending money. They're waiting so long to earn a lot of money. And a lot of times when 
when that happens, it, they feel like they're denied for so long. Whenever they start making money, it's easy for them from like their expenses to like skyrocket in like the first year or two. <laughs> and it's just like remarkable how, how often someone posts on there saying that like, oh, I deserve this, right? Because like we've yeah. been waiting so long. Uh, so I, I thought it was really in- it's interesting how our and, mindset and that, uh, is. Yeah. Our mindset, it's, it's, it's such a unique thing that only happens in medicine because we have such a long training path and then we finally mm-hmm. are rewarded at the end. Whereas most mm-hmm. careers, you're slowly rewarded every step of the way. And so you get promoted, your income goes up. You get promoted, your income goes up. But for us, we really have delayed gratification like almost no other industry. And I would mm-hmm. say that you know if you feel like you deserve it and you feel <clears throat> genuine happiness in buying that thing, just do it. But don't expect to deserve it in every avenue of your life like, <laughs> and, and retire early. If you want to make a million dollars and spend a million dollars, more power to you. If you feel like that is the life that is going to bring you happiness, I think you should pursue mm-hmm. that. But if you also don't want to work for 40 years, then you have to make <laughs> some sacrifices along the way. And so it's just mm-hmm. a matter of figuring your priorities. I don't think there's a right answer. It's just do some reflection, figure out what you want. So, you know, the retire early part, just to kind of get back to it, is, is so interesting to me. And I know I, I used to read some blogs and there were some popular ones out there, like Position on Fire, for example. I think has made um, a lot of rounds over the last few years. Um, it, you know, when that, when I look into that, and that, that's, that's a goal for me. And I don't necessarily also want to retire early, so to speak. I also want flexibility perhaps to be able to, um, you know, just be flexible in many things in my life. Um, but I think, you know, as a medical student, early training, it's so hard to think about that. Um, and I think some of these, these financial related topics and how I want my life to be in 10, 20 years, we're not really thinking about that as a student when we're making these big decisions on what specialties we should choose on, you know, what, um, what, you know, big kind of life decisions like that. And is, you know, h- how do we educate just the student population, especially medical students to think about these things beforehand? What is the easiest way to do that? And do you think it's okay that, that these kind of financial questions come into play when making these decisions? And did those ideas come into play when you made your decision to pursue not only a internal medicine residency and hospital, but you're also your hospitalist job and this specific job that you took. Yeah, no, those are really good points. And um, just trying to decompress all of those. Is it okay to think about it personally? I think yes. I think if you polled 100 <laughs> physicians who are career veterans, you may get different responses and say you should only do it for the right reasons. But right. It, it, and I think it's a, it's a shift. I think we're seeing it now with newer, newer graduates. I think people are starting to realize it is okay to think about it because it feeds into your mm-hmm. mental health. It feeds into your personal life, which feeds into burnout, which feeds into patient mm-hmm. care. And so at the end of the day, it all is related. And so I think it is okay to talk about And Mm -hmm. what can we do? I think it has to start at the top. So I did something in residency where uh, in in internal medicine, it's very unique. You become a second year and then you pretty much are put into a leadership role almost automatically. You'll start leading teams. And so you'll have interns, you'll have medical students, et cetera. And so for me- a second year, like a PGY2. Yeah, exactly. It's a PGY2, which is pretty quick early into your training. And- you know, I'll spend the first two and a half weeks of a rotation just going over chalk talks on all kinds of medical related things like heart failure, AKIs, whatever, anything people want to talk about. But I make it a point on the last weekend or the last week to have a 15 minute chalk talk about the things you have to know before you graduate uh, in terms of finances. And it's a very basic thing. We already talked about them. Mm. Like, what is a Roth IRA? What is an index fund? What is the stock market? What are your goals? Mm-hmm. Like, and that's it. And I think if you just plant that seed, people will, people will start thinking about it themselves. And I think the, mm-hmm. the idea is just to plant the seed and let people know that it's okay to talk about. And I, I try really make it a point with medical students also to, you know, ask them, what do you envision your life to be like in 10 years? And then ask mm-hmm. them to 
write down what do you think your specialty is going to provide you? Like, do you think it's accurate? And then ask your residents mm. and your attendings in that field, is this the life that you're living? And if the two don't match up, then you have to really think about it. And I wish I did mm. that because I was able to tailor a life now where I get what I want to do. Like I get to practice medicine the way I want and also work how I want, <laughs> but I don't think it's possible unless you think about it ahead of time. You have to ask yourself what you want and then you can tailor your career in that way. That's so mm -hmm. interesting. You know, you know, we make, especially like in this medical career, you know, you make this decision to go to medical school and it is like this commitment. You know, you make the decision to go to specific school, that's a commitment, a specific residency, that is a commitment. So yeah, I mean, thinking about it is so difficult, but that's so interesting that you're able to kind of right. do these chalk talks. And I, I'm curious, mm -hmm. What percentage, just like a rough estimate, would you say of the resident students you talked to were familiar with, you know, half of what you talked about? Uh, probably 25, one in four probably knew already, okay. like, but I think even then they gained some insight about the importance of reflection. Like everyone was able to take something away from it. And mm. it's interesting because the, th I consider myself to be a pretty good teacher, um, I actually won intern of the year in terms of a teaching award and like not to toot my own oh, horn, really? but I, I like, yeah, yeah I like teaching. <laughs> yeah. And so it was, it was um, nice. it's something I like to do. But then when I ask, you know, residents or like people that I were, uh, was in training with, like, what do they remember? And all of them, a hundred percent were like, dude, that Roth <laughs> IRA talk, like it changed my life. And I was like, you know, it, it's just awesome. funny because like I spend so much time, like I really wanted to be a cardiologist. So I used to have these like long heart failure talks and I thought they were interesting. But that's not what people cared about. <laughs> like people didn't care about that. Uh, they just remembered like, this is something I need to right. take into account. And then it, it it's different right. because when someone you know personally motivates you, it's just, mm -hmm. it, it's different than hearing it on a podcast or you know, on TV, like it, it, it's like a personal recommendation that you take more seriously. And so I think that's the power that each one of us have, like the people you interact with, your residents, the students, just talk to them about it. Cause they will, they know you and they know you're giving good advice. And so they'll take it much right. more seriously. Right. So is that reaction and kind of what they took from it, which is awesome. Is that kind of what convinced you and motivated you to make this YouTube channel? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think a part of it is I identified that there is definitely a need. Like I think it's important to talk about and there's not enough resources for people to reach out and, and learn about. And the White Cone Investor is great, but I think just having more resources out there and people will find the ones that they relate to the most, I think it's important. And so mm -hmm. it's really a win-win for me. Like I get to talk about the things that I really enjoy and I get to pay it forward. And so I, it still yeah. really goes back to like when I had that mentor when I was just mm -hmm. a scribe. If that, if that person didn't put me on that path, I don't think I'd be here right now. And so I just like to pay it forward. And then on another personal reason, like my parents were always high income earners, but they didn't do a good job of saving. And I didn't realize that until now. And so, you know, now it's, it's like, it's frustrating to see them who worked so hard their entire life, but they're still working really hard. And I don't think they really needed to be in this position if someone had a small conversation with them early on. And so yeah. it's, yeah. yeah. So what was, uh, AC, what's your, uh, your YouTube channel? What was the name of it? And because we, we would like people to hear about it and also we'll put it, uh, the link to it in our show notes. Um, it's just my name, Achint Patel. So if you just type down to YouTube, it'll just show up. It's just my name. Yeah. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> going back to your chalk talks, I imagine not all medical students are going to be fortunate to have someone like you, you know, when <laughs> a rotation or whatever, right? So. Uh, besides your, your, so we've heard about White Code Investor, right? The book, uh, we, your podcast, uh, your podcast, your YouTube channel is going to be very important for some people who are interested in this. Are there any other resources that you would recommend um, uh, besides those two that, you know, medical students or trainees or even attendants who want to know about this kind of stuff uh, can, can refer to? Yeah, I think those are good places to start for finances. <clears throat> um, White Code Investor, you can look up other things like uh, Optimal Finance Daily. There's a ton of podcasts out there. And I think there's, if you're interested in finance, you can all, you start to think about non-clinical things as well. And a podcast I really like is Think Docs Outside the Box. They do a really good job of talking about 
non non clinical careers in medicine as well. And I think all of this kind mm -hmm. of interplays together. So mm -hmm. you, if you just, you know, I, I'm sure there are a lot of podcasts out there. I'm sure if you just typed in finances for doctors onto the podcast <laughs> app, you'll get a ton. But if you just start <laughs> with the white coat investor and buy the book mm -hmm. and join the Facebook group, you're probably in a really good right. spot. Mm -hmm. I guess personally for me, you know, those things, those things are like, you know, definitely I listen to podcasts about finances, but like uh, Doximity, which, you know, I think we all know about Doximity, but like you can actually put in preferences for what kind of topics that you want to read. Mm -hmm. And so like, I get like this, like every week at the end of the week, like something about what is going on in radiation oncology, because that's what really matters to me. Um and you know about what kind of like you know studies that are out that are interesting and then also i get a lot of personal finance newsletter and i can click on whichever one i want to go to like i i think that's really cool because sometimes i just forget to go directly to doximity so i just get it in my email and i look at it and i think that's uh, that's a, another good uh, so doximity has their own personal finance newsletter as well they've like oh, no, they, to they, other people they, they aggregate from all the different doctors gotcha. that are in, uh, into mm. uh, personal finance uh, on the Kevin cool. MD, Physicians on Fire. You know, you sure. get so many different people coming on there. So I thought that was really cool as well. Um, so uh, AC, do you do you envision your interest in finance uh, with, with the rest of your career? What what, what does what does uh, your career look like in five years from now? Yeah, good good question. I preached a lot about self reflection, so I better have a good answer for this. <laughs> um, I think five years from now, I'll still be practicing as a hospitalist, um, whether it's in the same location or the same. I'm currently a nocturnist, so I only work nights, and for the time being, it's very sustainable. But I don't know if I can do that forever, so I may change the kind of the role I have. But I will be practicing mm -hmm. in some capacity, and. Ideally, you know, I would love to kind of do something similar to Jim Dowell, you know, like have a community and, and a YouTube channel or podcast where I kind of can just devote, you know, 50% of my time to just um, financial education for both, you know, people in healthcare, people out of healthcare. And I've even thought about just having more personal mentorship. I'm not a big fan of financial advisors because I think you can learn a lot of what you need to know by yourself. But I would love mm -hmm. to work with people on a more individual basis to kind of figure out, tailor plans for themselves. And I don't know, um, I'm not sure if that's something that is feasible because it's just easier to reach pe more people on things like a podcast or a book. But that that's something that, right. you know, I'd, all, I'd always consider. Mm -hmm. And we'll be following you, whatever it is that you, you do uh, in five years. I guess like you just talked about the future if you had to go back would you say you would do medicine again yeah good question uh i probably would have had very different answers in residency i think in residency <laughs> almost every day i was regretting my decision and i think it was a mix of things with covid and everything going on and being isolated from family but now that i've graduated um I probably would, I, I think I've, able, I've been able to find a way to kind of practice medicine the way I want and also tailor a life that I mm. think is going to be sustainable. And also I wouldn't have met any of the friends or people in medicine if I didn't pursue it. Like, I think that alone going, well, again, you know, Einstein, I think is the <laughs> pinnacle of my twenties. And I, I, I wouldn't really have it on the other way. I think if I, I would pay just to go to medical school and going through residency really teaches you a lot. You learn a lot about yourself, about other people. And although it's really tough, I, I do think it's a transformative process that not a lot of other people get to go through. And so if you, we complain about it a lot and I think it's a coping mechanism, you know, it's something we have to do to get through it. But at the end of the day, it, it is, it is quite a remarkable experience that we're allowed to go on. And so I think it's pretty cool. So I, I would probably do medicine again, but I would, highly encourage people to be reflective before <laughs> they decide to go in. Like ask yourself, why are you going into it? And if the answer right. is just money or prestige, it's not, not, not the right fit anymore. <laughs> so AC, thank you for joining us. I mean, this was an awesome conversation, uh, getting to know you, why you decided to start your channel, really about personal finance, investing for students and early trainees. And I love 
the story that you shared about, you know, your orthopedic surgeon you worked with and you wanted to pay it forward and the chalk talks you gave. Uh, so this was great. And we're going to put AC's YouTube channel um, down below and his contact info. So you can contact him if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, feel free to reach out to him and feel free to reach out to us, message us, and we can always put you in touch with him. Um, so listeners, thank you for joining us. Again, if you have any questions, comments, email us, message us on Twitter, comment on YouTube. And mm -hmm. AC, we do have one final question uh, that we'd like to ask all our guests. Is, is there a book you recently read or a TV show you watched that you'd like to recommend? Oh, I love this question. Um, Atomic Habits, for people who haven't heard oh, about it yet, dude. is oh, the, is it, the most, is it, it is the is most it important book. Yeah, James Clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I've read this yeah. book four times in the last six months, and it is actually life-changing. So if you haven't heard it yet on audiobook or listened to it or read it, highly recommend it. Nice. Yeah, like I was telling you, I just got it because you told me about it, and it's been on my list for a while, but it really has been amazing. <laughs> yep. see, thank you, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you.